it wouldn't be fair to lead you to believe that only uh, viruses are the only microbes that cause cancer. Uh, a very, very specific bacteria does as well, and our knowledge about it is growing by leaps and bounds. And it's the same bacteria that causes duodenal and stomach ulcers and stomach inflammation, Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori causes, it's not a factor, it causes 100% of all gastric lymphomas. Uh, these are called maltomas because the lymphoid tissue is mucosal associated. So the lymphomas of the lymphoid tissue, which is around the mucosa of the GI tract and other places, are called maltomas. And also, it has been strongly indicted in epithelial malignancies or gastric adenocarcinomas as well. So uh, it would not be fair if you thought viruses were the only things that uh, cause cancer. This is like... Uh, the classical prototype of a bacteria. Uh, let's talk about the good guys now. Up until now, we talked about the bad guys, the cancer cells. Let's talk about our body. Let's talk about what it does to fight and maintain and destroy. And basically, uh, you have to understand the concept of immune surveillance. And immune surveillance is related to the fact that when our body sees cells, cancer cells, potential cancer cells, uh, that is not uh, recognized uh, as part of the MHC system, it destroys them. And the, the main tumor cell, I'm sorry, the main cell to attack and destroy tumors directly are the CD8 T cells. These are, so when you see a, a a tumor under a microscope and it looks like it's causing a lot of inflammation you see a lot of lymphocytes around it most likely those are cd8 plus uh, t cells attacking the tumor directly because it has been recognized that these cells should be attacked in the case of nk cells for example it attacks the cells uh, even if it hasn't recognized them once again it was like rodney dangerfield's uh, uh, football buddies. After it attacked a quarterback, it went after his family. I mean, they're very nonspecific killers, as well as our usual gang of macrophages, which are chewing up the fragments, and uh, antibodies as well. So if you want to think of these four uh, items here as the main players in the immune surveillance system, you certainly can. And if you want to think of it graphically, if you want to think that the normal cell is protected, from a T cell because all of its antigens are recognized, uh, it's therefore going to be left alone. You could think of that. But if you have an oncogene which produces an oncoprotein which normally uh, is not recognized, that will be attacked by a T cell or hopefully will be attacked by a T cell. On the other hand, you could have a mutated self protein or an overexpressed self protein being attacked by a T cell for the same reason. Uh, you can have an oncogenic virus which can be attacked uh, before, during, or after it's doing its thing inside the cell. So the general concept is if cells are altered through this process of what we call transformation, uh, they may and should be and often are recognized as antigenic uh, bad guys and therefore will be attacked by the CD8 plus T lymphocytes. And these are the main cells, which are the main eliminators of uh, tumor cells. But getting back to the bad guys again, they do a whole wide variety of tricks, which uh, uh, may cause problems with immune surveillance. And the one thing they do is mutate. So if cells are normally being attacked, they can mutate in order to survive so as not to be attacked. It's all part of, you know, uh, evolution. Uh, you might have a tumor cell which has a decrease in MHC molecules on its surface and therefore less likely to be attacked as well. That's another uh, mechanism. Um, also, there's the concept of co-stimulation molecules. Uh, as you know, uh, in order for T cells to uh, attack, they not only need antigens, but they need co-stimulation molecules. If there's a lack of them, you may have decreased immune uh, surveillance. 
immunosuppressive agents weaken any uh, process, including uh, immune surveillance. The uh, antigen uh, expressions on tumor cells may be masked by other compounds and therefore escape immune surveillance by that mechanism as well. And last but not least, you may have a process by which the cytotoxic T cells are triggered off to be apoptotic and therefore not present in uh, enough strength or enough amounts to do immune surveillance. These are all six common mechanisms by which tumor cells can escape immune surveillance and I hope I explained them uh, clearly enough. Another thing to remember is that once you have a tumor, a detectable tumor, an anatomic lesion, this lesion is growing. It will uh, encroach. It will invade. It will put pressure on. It will destroy. It will infiltrate its neighbors. So a good knowledge of anatomy in terms of what is close to what would be a predictable uh, prototype for what a tumor is going to do as it encroaches upon its neighbor. A tumor may also produce hormones and cause a physiologic syndrome. A tumor in the process of destroying a blood vessel or weakening a mucosal surface by virtue of destroying a mucosal surface may result in bleeding and infection as well. Uh, these uh, symptoms may be quite acute as well. If a tumor uh, ruptures an organ or it infarcts an organ, you can have a very acute uh, um, syndrome or symptom uh, acutely as well. And once again, if the tumor is at the point where it's uh, metastatic, this metastatic lesion can once again do all the same things anatomically and physiologically that its apparent uh, blob of tumor cells did as well. Another general uh, symptom of uh, widespread tumor is the concept of cachexia. Normally, when you have a reduced f uh, diet, you lose fat much, much more so than you would lose muscle. But in cachexia, there is a greater proportion to muscle loss with regards to fat. And we know that there are factors like tumor necrosis factor, which uh, um, when they are doing their job, destroy tissues and result in cachexia. Interleukin-1s can do exactly the same thing. In addition, another uh, factor called PIF or proteolysis-inducing factor is expressed in greater amounts and activated in malignancies, and this has a similar effect of producing proteolysis. So these are some of the biochemical mechanisms to explain uh, cachexia. Another concept is that of a perineoplastic syndrome. A perineoplastic syndrome is defined as a syndrome secondary to a tumor, but not necessarily because of its direct anatomic or physiologic effect. And the most obvious uh, type of perineoplastic syndrome would be a uh, endocrinopathy or a tumor which produces excessive amounts of an endocrine hormone resulting in an endocrine-like uh, syndrome like uh, Cushing syndrome for example. A lot of the nerve and muscle uh, degenerative disorders like myasthenia we are seeing with lung cancer can be regarded as a perineoplastic syndrome. Skin conditions like acanthosis nigricans or dermatomyositis. These are often seen in uh, malignancies, but not necessarily because of the direct effect of the malignancies. HPOA, or a hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, overgrowth of the joint, seen with a lot of uh, cancers, lung cancers. Uh, vascular syndromes, like Trousseau syndrome, or migratory thrombophlebitis or tumor endocarditis are seen uh, with uh, as a perineoplastic syndromes. Anemias are present almost universally in widespread malignancies as a hematologic perineoplastic syndrome. And last but not least, we will learn that nephrotic syndromes can be due to a wide variety of renal diseases, but they can also be seen in general malignancies as well, independent of primary renal pathologies. So 
This is the generally the family of perineoplastic syndromes, and we're going to talk about the big one first, endocrine. I thank you very much.